Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vince Stone, joined every week by Jill Bryant, and this week we're going to be talking a lot about Canonical, a lot about Ubuntu, and strangely, a lot about flat packs. Yeah. Buckle up, let's get into that. Fair warning, if you're listening to the live stream, I can usually take care of anything in post. Playing around with a couple of things on the audio side. We were talking about in the pre-show, if you're a patron, go back and listen to that. The um, Twitch has a VOD system. So like right at the beginning of the show, I'm playing around and, you know, everything. So, oh my God, everything's not perfect. So, uh, you know, fire signals go out. But Twitch has an option if you don't know about it. I'm thinking about getting it set up. So if you have any background music playing and, you know, they have to mute it for whatever reason. And by whatever reason, somebody files a, you know, DMCA takedown or whatever claim uh, against whatever you got going on in the background. Which can hit the best of us, which can hit the best of us because sometimes game developers do not license the game audio for like streaming. And I'm, you might have run into that yourself. You know, you'll go to play a game, just, hey, all right, this looks like a fun game. You'll go back to stream it and you will uh, check uh, the VOD on Twitch and it'll just be muted. Like just big segments will just be muted. And you're like, what's going on? Hmm. This will let you get around that. You know, it'll be able to cut out the music. So if you're still talking, you can, you know, convey like, hey, you know, this, nice. this, what's going on? Still need some work. Still need some work on that. But I'm also removing Audacity out of our um, workflow, out of our tool chain. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't have the patience for it. I don't. I was talking about this. If you get a chance to, you know, come hang out with me on Sundays, if you get questions about, you know, audio, video, content creation, production, under the Penguin, under the Linux. That's what I'm there for on Sundays when I'm editing Linux Teamcast Weekly. Maybe you get a question that's not going to fit into one of these shows. You know, because, you know, sometimes we see questions fly by doing a show live, like, can't an stop the show and answer that. So if you got those questions, save them for Sundays. Come check them out. And Audacity is, I'm terrified of using it at this point because Muse is determined to turn it into something that, I don't think is a good fit for it, which is a digital audio workstation. And if they're going to turn Audacity into a really like daw of questionable abilities, and like I don't trust this thing the entire time I'm using it at this point, I might as well just use another DAW. So I'm using Reaper on top of Reaper to record our live and uncut shows, which is kind of interesting. I'm like, hmm. Those of you listening to the live and uncut, hi, this is the first episode with that. And you're like, man, this sounds a lot better. It probably does. So how about you, Jill? Um, so we've been here in, in California and particularly in Southern California, we've been having a winter blizzard. I'm sure you've heard about that on the news. So there was actually snow on the Hollywood sign, Vin. And there's only snow a mile from my house in the foothills at the beach. I'm, I'm literally at sea level. And there is snow on, on the small hills next to me. <laughs> it's just amazing. So we had lots of rain and hail and snow. But thank goodness now it's going away. So we're going to be back to our normal temperatures in the next few days. I'm so happy. <laughs> Poor guys are panicking. But it was cute. You see all these pictures in Discord of like, like maybe if you zoomed in on it, you you could see something that looked like it might have been hail for a minute, for twenty yeah. seconds. You know, the stuff that you dust off your car in the morning. <laughs> well, the the picture that was actually taken from the local Pals Verdes uh, foothills is a actually snow. There were tracks in the snow from cars, and it's surreal because you see all the palm trees there on the hills, and and you know that's a dichotomy there with the ocean in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Very unique. <laughs> so, and another big thing, of course, is the Southern California Linux Expo Scale 20X is coming next week. And we will probably not be, we won't have, be having an LWW for the next two weeks unless, unless Finn has, uh, brings on Jordan or Pedro. <laughs> or maybe he's going to take a break too <laughs> for two weeks. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh, Ben's giving me a look. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so next week, uh, starting March 9th through 12th of 
this year, of course, is Scale. And it's, it's the world's uh, largest uh, community-run Linux convention. And um, it's at the Pasadena Convention Center in Pasadena. And you can use promo code CHIX for 50% off your scale registration. Th thanks to my local group, the Linux Chicks of Los Angeles. <laughs> and just go to uh, SoCalLinuxExpo.org to register and find out all the deets. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, well, I could do more, but I was trying to keep it short. <laughs> oh, you, so you're going to chop off that last sentence? <laughs> no, I, I won't. So, <laughs> so you can find me at the Linux Chicks LA booth number 234, which is also next door to the Text Digital Destination Linux booth, the other podcast I do. We have a booth as well. And we're around the corner from the Lutris booth. So we're all one big family. And what's really cool is Glorious Egg Roll, a well-known Proton and Lutris dev, is coming out and will be helping Strider at the Lutris booth, as well as our wonderful patron Alex Sipes in chat. And M Empty is coming too, and uh, Mir and Mr. Alert in chat will also be there, of course. Yay! And Steve Husband, <laughs> my husband. <laughs> so, got lots of people coming from our, our LGC community, and it's going to be awesome. And remember, there's still time to get tickets. Head over to SoCalExpo.org yes. where you can pick up that now. Yeah. Do we <laughs> dare talk about what the community as a whole was upset about earlier this week? Yeah. So the containerized flat pack format will actually no longer be available out of the box in any of Ubuntu's official flavors, according to Canonical. So the Ubuntu developers have agreed to stop shipping Flatpak, pre-installed Flatpak apps, and any plugins needed to install Flatpak apps through a GUI software tool in the default you know, package set. This will be implemented in all of eight Ubuntu's official flavors in the upcoming Ubuntu 23.04 Lunar Lobster release. That includes you know, Zubuntu, Kubuntu, and um, all the other awesome um, eight flavors out there. The other unofficial Ubuntu-based distros like Pop! OS or Linux Mint will not be affected. So, and, and in some ways, this does make sense that Canonical wants to keep people in their own ecosystem as, as a default and not uh, their competitors, especially since flat packs don't receive support, bug fixes, and the development attention as repo and snaps apps do from Ubuntu's community of developers or canonical themselves. So it kind of kind of makes sense and and there are some reasons for this and one of them is that snaps uh, support server apps on machines with no GUI, which Flatback can't. And it's the only packaging format. What do you mean by that? Because uh, uh, you don't need yeah. a way to run flatbacks at all. It's yeah. not a problem. But I know, I know. And that's <laughs> that was what was in the article. And uh, Snap, you know, Snap support server apps on machines with, with no GUI. Yes, flat packs do, but not in the way Snaps do. So uh, yeah, yeah, That's why we need some clarification yeah. on that. Yeah. Definitely. And, uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's okay. And it's the only, uh, packaging format in Ubuntu core. And, uh, Canonical says that there's several downsides to having multiple cross platform packager packages installed. Like, you know, they don't understand one another's dependency mechanisms, which can lead to significant duplication of large packages. Whether you use the apt or apt get commands, none of these will update flat pack apps. And snaps have to be updated separately. And Ubuntu schedules this as a background task by default. And so flat pack users have to update manually, which is true. But don't worry. Um, you could just run sudo apt install flat pack manually and install it as usual, like I do. <laughs> so. Yeah, this had the community up in, in a roar, and I understand why. This is a little creepy. <laughs> so, 
but I, in some ways, I understand why Canonical is doing it. And uh, they're, they're, you know, again, not making it, um, you, you can install flat packs like you, you used to before. You just can't do it with um, an easy to use GUI in the repositories. So uh, that's all this is, really. I know Vin has a lot of thoughts about this, too. <laughs> I'm just curious about some reporting because unless I'm completely off now, this initial article came from the register. So you can take this what you will. And that's where Jill was sourcing her information. Yeah. To which I'm going to ask, I'll ask the audience um, to the best. This snap remains more capable tool. that supports server apps on machines with no GUI, which Flatpak can. What? That's what I want some clarification on. What uh, is there a breakdown communication here? Yeah. Because uh, there's entire distributions built using flat packs flat pack. silver blue. Yeah, silver blue. And or everything. Uh, endless OS. Pack. And, you know, there's several up of them out there. So, register, I believe you might be a wee incorrect on that. You might be a little, just a little bit. Um, yeah. Reading through this, a lot of people are upset. And I'm going to say rightfully so. There's a couple different ways to look at this. Um, you know, you bring up like Ubuntu based distros like Pop OS and Mint are not going to be affected. Nor should they be because, you know, when yeah. you, I think when people think of Pop, people think of Mint. They don't, they don't think of like, oh, that's a, an Ubuntu spin. I'm like, no, yeah. no they're, they're, they're their own distros at this point, right? Yeah. That would be Absolutely. like. Absolutely. <laughs> then again, you know, maybe you consider Ubuntu a Debian spin. Yeah, I, well, yeah, it, it's 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 Debian with some tools on top to to make it so called easier for the end user. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Another thing true. I want to touch on is Canonical wants to keep people in their own ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe, maybe. We do get to remember that uh, the Snap backend is a closed sourced ecosystem mm -hmm. that you have no control over at all. You do what you're told, and um, maybe you want to live that life. You know, Flatpak's not cool like that. It doesn't have a uh, single vendor controlled closed source backend like Snap. So, point for Snap. Um, what else do we yeah. have? Flat packs don't receive support bug fixes and development attention. At, okay. If security was the real problem here, if that was a real legitimate issue in any way, shape, form, or fashion, you'd disable support for PPAs. Uh, yeah, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> you would. Yeah. Like, that, that's a bigger security issue than um, flat packs yeah. or snaps. Yeah, because those are done by third parties and mm. sometimes they're not well updated and there's issues with them. Now, that is a good thing. Like, Ubuntu Core doesn't have PPAs, but that's our theorem brings that up. Uh, this is about the Ubuntu flavors that are taken out um, flatback. Yeah, true. So, I do believe that all the um, Ubuntu flavors have support for PPAs, unless I'm wrong about that again. But here's what I really want to think about like, is it really confusion for the end user? To have both flat packs and snaps installed. And I mean, did Microsoft really believe having more than one web browser was going to confuse the end user? Did they really yeah. believe that? I don't think so. And I kind of feel like this, I don't know, no, kind of like this just reeks of like not having faith in your own product. Well, like, mm -hmm. yeah. But let, let, let the best one win here. Yeah. <laughs> Or limiting, limiting choice without limiting choice is a way to say, you know, doing, here, here's what it is. Here it is. Let it win on its own merit, but here's what I really want to know. Here's what I think everybody's missing out on. What did Canonical do to convince eight individual spins to universally agree to do this? Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that is the question, especially like, like, um, I'm thinking of Martin M Wimpress because uh, Ubuntu Mate, it's already been initiated as a GUI. They haven't um, made that system yet, like 
other other distros were planning to in the next release? I don't know. I don't know. I think that's the real question because everybody in lockstep said, sir, yes, sir, we'll do that. No problem. When you have to assume out of like eight different maintainers, somebody's like, nah, maybe we're just going to leave it in. I'm like, no, yeah. you're not. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. going to go out on a really short, thick limb here and say there were um, canonicals doing a little bit more than asking nicely in order to make that happen. But brings mm. us to this, doesn't it? Because, you know, yeah. Blue Hat is pushing the flat packs. Canonical's pushing the snaps. What are us, you know, just lowly peasant, regular users, what are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Answer's real simple. You stay away from corporate-backed controlled distributions. Go install Arch. Yeah. Go install Debian. I would say go install Slackware and Jet2, but, you know, those type of people are already running it. Yeah. Or, or OpenSUSE, which I love too. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it, it is a little weird because my feeling is that the whole point of Linux is that you have choice. You have a choice of different package, package uh, management systems. Uh, we, we've got app images as well. You know, it's, uh, uh, yeah, cutting off the use of one is just, is, is a little strange. <laughs> Especially from the GUI, where it's easier for new users to use. For those of us who've been ar around for a long time, we know how to do it via command line. But I don't, yeah, <laughs> it's canonical's a weird one. Canonical is something a lot of us are um, have been around long enough to watch it start as that. Hey, you know, it's got a good backer. You know, Shuttleworth was back, and he was like, "Hey, let's do some good. Let, let's get make an easy to use Linux thing." And we we. You know, you live long enough to where everybody becomes your enemy, basically, right? Yeah. And, you know, it was a couple of years ago, you know, it, it, there was the shift at Canonical. It went from, all right, let's just do a bunch of cool stuff, too. We got to start making money. Mm hmm And their investment in the cloud and Snaps was a part of that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's weird. And it's weird to see that. And, you know, I know somebody's going to buy. Even Fedora, you got to be wary of because who finances Fedora? Red Hat. Mm -hmm. Red Hat. Yeah. And they use flat packs. So, and it's obvious, you know, Canonical and Red Hat are, you know, are, are competitors. So, even though they both contribute heavily to open source and, and share resources, they are, at the end of the day, com competitors and trying to make money. They are. And, you know, I, I go back, I don't even go back and forth on this. Like, we go back and listen if you want a good uh, discussion. Jordan and I probably spent the better part of like 15 minutes arguing about uh, the usefulness of containerized desktop applications for end users. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still strictly against it because it doesn't seem like it's solving a problem. It doesn't seem, you know, I, I firmly believe that it is not a benefit to the end user. I'm not, I'm, I'm just not seeing it as like, let's not yeah. use shared libraries. Why not reasons? And let's, con just, <laughs> there's so many hurdles to jump through. And it's like, I, I've, I've been told for the past several years, don't worry, you'll get there. Like, what yeah. was broke to begin with? <laughs> I agree, Ben. I, I do understand the needs for it for, you know, server and cloud because it's easy to, you know, update and maintain uh, the apps. And, you know, like, like we do here on LWW, we, we test often, you know, Kden Live and um, OBS, you know, with app images or flat packs. So it's, <laughs> it's a nice container for that, for testing out apps. But I still prefer my uh, Debs and uh, <laughs> the the native formats. I still prefer. Well, I don't like having to have a entirely different system installed. You know, like um, the mechanisms to you know the the, the equivalent of the Flatback Store, the Snap Store, the installers. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one thing app images have have as an advantage. You just double click yeah. on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Why? This is this is where everyone I everyone loses me. Like, why are we going? Why is the effort 
being spent on this? What's the end goal here? I don't get it. <laughs> I want somebody to come smack me around <laughs> and shake me a little bit and go, you know, where, where it's a positive conclusion where I can get behind it and go, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Or why didn't I see it this way? I, I haven't had that happen yet. Hmm. Well, Server guess, side, like, you can make the yeah. argument. Desktop yeah. and user, it just doesn't. Doesn't make sense. To me personally, it just doesn't make sense. I don't. Um, and again, could be old, could be out of touch. I have no problem yeah. admitting that. That's why I'm sitting here publicly making a plea. I'd love you to come on the show and explain to me. <laughs> and I, I'm not trying to pick a fight. Yeah, I like education. I like learning things. Yes. And if you if you could lay it out from an end user's perspective, not a developer's perspective, not deployment perspective, mm -hmm. not a Packager, maintainer, uh, no, end user's perspective, why this is a plus one. Yeah. Well, I do know a lot of users who use Flatpak exclusively on the desktop. I do too. And they contact <laughs> yeah. me with problems and I tell them to uninstall a Flatpak and put regular yeah. OBS on their system. <laughs> I don't, you know, personally, 99% uh, of, of what I install are, are, uh, Debs, or I use a DNF or the AUR. I I use the local systems, <laughs> but I will use app images and flat packs and occasionally snaps to test uh, the latest and greatest in software. Um, I mean, it could just be personal experience. My primary experience, um, I don't really deal with snaps at all, but I do have a little bit of experience working with uh, the official distribution method, uh, containerization des containerized desktop version of OBS is Flatpak. They've decided to go with Flatpak. And I'm getting some blowback from, you know, mm -hmm. I volunteer my time. I'm like, if I can help somebody out, I'll gladly help them out. I'm like, I'm having this problem, this problem, this problem. And my first question is, are you running OBS as a Flatpak? Yeah, that's usually what the, and, the issue um, is. If the answer is yes, and it's like, I can't help you. And again, you know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to be that person online that doesn't know what they're talking about, but still tries to help because they just want to participate in the conversation and they end up causing more pain and struggle for the other person. You know, the person I'm talking about, you ran oh, into yeah. that, you've been in that <laughs> comment thread when you're looking for the solution and there's that one person who keeps <laughs> just spitballing information in the forum thread with no idea what they're talking about. Like, why? Why? I just need the fix. I don't want to ever be that guy, but yeah, dependency issues are a thing <laughs> with containers too. <laughs> Here's the thing: at the end of the day, pick and choose. You know, um, we could rewind like ten years ago, right? Let's just dial this back to uh, what year is this? 2023. Yeah, 20, 2013. Let's go back to 2013. So yeah, ten years ago, 1476. <laughs> All right, um, you would find. <laughs> A non insignificant amount of um, Ubuntu, like diehard champions. You know, you, mm -hmm. you say something. Oh yeah, because yeah, they, they were one of the the best at at that time, especially for a new user, and still are in many ways. New user, uh, you know, Steam yeah. was on based mm -hmm. on a uh, Debian. Well, yeah. it was based on Ubuntu. I mean, Ubuntu, you look at Ubuntu yeah. underscore thirty two. A lot of good, a lot of good. And here we are in 2023, and we're just like, yeah, well, that's another weird thing you're doing. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because they, they shifted their focus on, from the desktop to the cloud and AI and server side. Uh, that That's definitely, but they have done a very good job at, at making sure that um, we're getting updates a little quicker and, and on with uh, the core and GNOME, it's, that's really been helpful. Moral of the story is just use Debian. Yeah, I love Debian. <laughs> it's cool. It's an awesome operating system. I use it. And, you know, that, that's it. The moral of the story is use whatever distribution that you're currently using or use the one that you like the best and don't let anybody else tell you what you should mm. be using. So that, true. <laughs> There you go. Try to argue with me on that one. Uh, yeah, that's the beauty of Linux. We right. have choice. 
you know, we're, we're, we're not stuck. Yeah. We're not um, you're like, no, I'm going to continue running Windows. Like, what do you do in the Windows? Like, you just stay on 7, not a spike. Like, I'm not ever upgrading from Windows 7. Why? Because I'm a Windows 7 type of person. I'm not <laughs> one of you Windows 10 or 11 weirdos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Canonical's free to do this. Uh, I have more questions I, about why was why has this been pushed out to, I guess we should say what a, a spin is, you know? So what, what are the different spins currently right now? Um, we're going to have Zubuntu, look. Uh, mm. Kubuntu. I know there's eight of them, right? Yeah. And uh, Ubuntu Unity. Yeah, flavors. Unity. Yeah, <laughs> mm, they're spins. We, we've already decided what we call these things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can I pick them off? Uh, okay, that one's XFCE. That one's Mate. Um, mm-hmm. that's the only two I can pick up. I can pick up the mouse, and I can pick up the green funky triangle. Can Ubuntu? Is <laughs> Ubuntu? <laughs> we got Ubuntu, Lubuntu, which yeah, is Lubuntu uh, and LXQT, Budgie. Um. So let's get the budgie desktop. Kylan. Do Kylan. Yeah. For Chinese users. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, mate. Mm-hmm. Uh, studio. Okay. I didn't know what yeah. studio was like an official. Oh, one. yeah. Yeah. And Unity. Unity's back. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, Zubat- the superior one um, <laughs> for older machines. <laughs> Oh, you silly kids. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, here, here's a hot take, Jill. So what? this is just Ubuntu with a bunch of different DMs installed on it? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, some of them have their own own uh, unique way of doing things. things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like a Ubuntu Mate, actually. They... They started out with their welcome screen, and so now a lot of the other flavors are including the welcome screen. So there have been a lot of innovations on certain ones. So yeah, yeah, things. I decided to uh, install <laughs> uh, Mate instead of Zubuntu. Why did you decide to do that? Oh, so I could change the DM. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could do what I do, Vin, and I just install Window Maker or Rat Poison, <laughs> or what I'm using right now is Enlightenment. <laughs> I don't even, I just use the Ubuntu core, really. I, I don't usually use the default OSs. <laughs> like yeah, default see, I, desktops. I, 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 mean. don't, I don't run Debian spins. I yeah. mean flavors. <laughs> like Ubuntu. Yeah, that's right, Ubuntu. You're now flavor of Debian. Deal with it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're just talking about sub-flavors. <laughs> what do we got yeah. up next? <laughs> wow. See, so, more Ubuntu news, Ben. <laughs> so we have Ubuntu plans to release a new minimal ISO as part of the upcoming Ubuntu 23.04 Lunar Lobster release. The mini ISO should be around 140 megabytes in size, and it's not available yet, and they are still working on it, but the effort is actually being headed by Dan Bungert, the maintainer of Subiquity, which is the tech underpinning Ubuntu's new uh, Flutter-based installer, which is really quite cool. So Canonical's Lucas Zemzak explains, the Ubuntu Mini ISO is a small, beautiful ISO that can be either downloaded and used on a CD, USB drive, or even via UEFI HTTP that brings up a dynamic TUI menu of what Ubuntu images you want to download, install to your target system. So pretty cool. And um, hopefully this will make installing the Ubuntu flavors really easy as well. And one of the things I actually wanted to point out about this is there have been other mini Ubuntu images floating around over the years, some of which I've actually um, tested and used because I need uh, needed a, a smaller uh, the the core base a, a smaller version to install and to build from so those come in really handy but the unique thing about this one it is an officially supported will be officially supported and tested by canonical so it's kind of one of their new flavors let's say a mini one 
I don't know, man. This sounds like nut stole with a bunch of extra stumps. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does kind of. <laughs> Bye, Pin. I didn't really want you. That's Aww. how I let you fall. Um, <laughs> so, you know, instead of doing... How does this work exactly? Because I, I was looking over it, and like, does this, like, download the... I, can you in, then install the ISO? Yeah, it's... From... It, hmm. Yeah, so the... It said that it loads it into memory, and I believe that's the menu it loads into memory with the the core um, packages, mm -hmm. and then it downloads the the full um, Ubuntu install. Okay. The, the, it, from the article I read, that's what kind of how they were explaining it. Yeah, it downloads the ISO of the interest into memory and uh, chain boots into it, allowing installation of. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, <laughs> I guess uh, just make it make it a small compact I, I, Ubuntu. I, I <laughs> but this is like an extra hundred and forty megs. So you just download the ISO that you wanted and plug it. In. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess you're right about that. <laughs> but this this does should have all the core libraries, so you could build one yourself. But yeah, with your ex window manager or whatever, <laughs> Wayland. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, I, I, I'm desperately reading through this right now again, just like. Yeah. Well, it's funny, Vin, because uh, the original uh, Ubuntu minis I have used before was actually just a, a self contained, like, I think the last one I used was like 230 megs, a self-contained Ubuntu. And yeah, then you like just, a, a stripped-down yeah. ISO, like something like just yeah. quick and nasty to get up and running and booting. Like that, I'm like, okay, exactly. I, can see, I, I can see utility <laughs> yeah. in this. And yeah. that's kind of what I thought this was, Jill, to be honest. So I just glanced at yeah. your article, and I'm going through it right now, and I was listening to what you were saying. I'm like, this, this is just installing Ubuntu with an extra step to the best I can tell. Mm -hmm. Could be completely yeah. the wrong. We'll, we'll be finding more information later and, and when we can test it too. That'll make a big difference. <laughs> um, let, me, let me take a look at the um, mailing list here. <laughs> um, that doesn't. <laughs> Who linked to this? Uh, the project was shared on the, at this weekend. Okay, let, let, okay, OMG on Ubuntu. I click on this and you just take me to this full thread. Our 2023 archive threads. Like you couldn't be arsed. Ah. <laughs> to link to the um boo um all right so that's the thing that happened yeah it's coming <laughs> we'll tell you more about it when we know more about it but yeah, yeah. In, in its current state right now it looks like you put it on a thumb drive you put it in the system and it says here's all the Ubuntu's that you can install yeah maybe that's the utility of it though um where you don't want to be bothered yeah, so you don't have to to make separate ISO images, you know, using some of the other utilities on on a flash drive to put multiple uh, flavors on a flash drive. That that would be convenient. That would be neat. Mm -hmm. Convenient. <laughs> 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 I, I'm trying. I'm working through a use case right now. I'm not. I'm not poo pooing on the project yeah. at all. I'm like convenient for what though? Oh, this is like hmm. Maybe if you could customize it, though. This is this is here's the utility that I'm thinking about. Oh yeah, yeah. Because this, they said you can customize it, but we don't know in what way yet. Here's the utility I'm thinking about, everybody. Um, we could take it and you could set up. Uh, say you had uh, particular versions you needed for different uh, organizations inside your company. Like you're running LTS on whatever this version, yeah. but you're running, you know. Uh, licorice lobsters or whatever in like another department and mm. maybe you could do that like that would make sense to have all that on one drive right yeah yeah that makes sense and you know what's what's interesting Ben, is this also comes at a time they just announced that they're going they're creating an easy uh, gui tool to make a bunch of uh, flavors from your installed desktop and uh that might have something to do with why these a bunch of mini is coming out about the same time <laughs> as uh, that utility. So 
They're just trying to make Ubuntu customization easy on the desktop and on server side. Mm. And how much effort do you really want to put into um, Canonical? When are you going to start making your own PCs? Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. there we go. <laughs> they they uh, <laughs> made a phone for a while. <laughs> Why are you going to be mean, Joe? Uh-oh. You had a oh. little bandwidth hiccup. Oh, I did. Yeah. Oh. It didn't tell me. It was funny because it didn't say anything. It just uh, blinked out. You were just like, <laughs> ah. And I was accusing you of being mm. mean. <laughs> you know what? We are having lots of wind here. And that is uh, something that can lead to brownouts. <laughs> so. No, no, no. In my world, the higher the wind gets, the more data bits get blown out of the fiber cables. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the fiber cable is above our house. Yes. And directly into my, it's going from um, a telephone pole uh, behind us and the wire, you know, hangs, hangs from the telephone pole into the house. And then it goes directly into this room. So to get back to that, yeah, they tried a phone and to what Don was saying, Canonical used to do that though. This is, this is like the weird relationship I have with Canonical because, you know, I didn't agree with a lot of stuff Canonical did like throughout time, but you know, I'm some, when, you know, Yahoo on the internet, right? Big deal. Yeah. But I always had a lot of respect for uh, Canonical doing a bunch of the moon, Moonshot projects and stuff that didn't make any sense. You know, rewind the tape. I was a proponent of Mir. I thought Mir was an incredibly oh, yeah. bad idea. Didn't make any sense, but somebody needed to try it. The phone, bad idea. Didn't make any sense. Somebody needed to try it. And they were doing yeah. these like random wacky things that your first mm-hmm. thought is like, why would you do that? Because you yeah. need somebody doing the crazy Moonshot stuff. Yeah, they're trying to be innovative, like when they went from GNOME to Unity, and now we're back on GNOME again. <laughs> so you know, so, sometimes they're they're they. You got to try stuff. I mean, you put a shot out there and see what works and see what doesn't. I mean, they were very innovative with the phones with convergence. They were the ones who you know started that whole concept, and now it, it's come to fruition. A lot of companies are are using those concepts. So. Yeah, I mean, I applaud them for all their all their wonderful innovation, That's, and uh, being the the first kind of the first distro that uh, so many new users used and made installing Linux easy. Yeah, because it sent you the disk. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and people were just ordering on Ubuntu CDs because they needed fresh coasters. I mean, yeah. <laughs> let's be realistic about that. Um. But no, that always brings me back to the um, when's Canonical is going to start making um, computers because that's you, a, it's a great idea. Well, we really got to get outside of our bubble because the yeah. average person a doesn't have a desktop computer. Mm-hmm. Go run the numbers, like look at yeah, your country's population mobile. versus how many um, you know PCs sales in the, over the last like de- decade. Yeah, it's mobile. No, but like they might have a laptop. Might might have a laptop. Yeah. Yeah, the average person is nowhere near to the point of um, wanting, wanting to, A, know what operating system their computer runs, B, reinstall it, C, install something completely different and learn it. Yeah. And one mm-hmm. big advantage, um, you know, like System76 has with like Pop! OS is, you know, they were doing the hardware. Yeah, they're doing the hardware with it. So they it's got amazing. that chain control with it. And you know, HP, Dell, and all that, to lesser extents, lesser involvement, you know, because they also have other options. It'd be interesting to see Canonical take that, and, and you know, that the problem with doing hardware is such a razor-thin, like, margin. I mean, it's not a great business to be in, but it's having that full stack to be able to, like, hey, I need 12 workstations. Mm-hmm. Like, you might be able to get them from Canonical, or, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm just curious, but yeah, it's sad to not see him, you know, speaking like Moonshot stuff, like uh, System76 was, just did an update on the, uh, what's that new desktop they're working on? Oh, yeah, their new uh, Cosmic Rust-based yeah. Cosmic desktop. That's going to be, that's exciting coming down the line. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I look at that and I'm like, that's a bad idea. Love it. <laughs> you know? And, yeah. But I, I love seeing stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Doesn't make a bit of sense to me, but that doesn't matter. Keep doing it, rock on, and you know, try it. Somebody, you know, you got to have these people out there trying to do stuff like that, and that that, that makes me happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. 
Coming up next, um, you know what also makes me happy, Jill? What then? Well, we get new patrons. Yes. The people head over to patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast and they're like, you know what? We like these weirdos. We like these yahoos. We like people who are going to have an honest discussion about canonical and flat packs and snaps and whatever that other thing was that lets you install a bunch of yeah. little distributions. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, just have a good time. Say what we want to say. Um, you're able to support that. You're able to finance that. And we do thank you for your support. I do want to thank uh, M. Foxdog, who mm-hmm. upped his pledge Yeah. right before and- the show. He thought he was going to get away with it. He was like, you know what? If I do it before the show, well, I don't Maybe know. Maybe no one will notice. No, well, nobody's <laughs> going to embarrass me. I'm like, too late, bro. I got you. Aww. I wrote that down. And uh, Mac Geek resubbed uh, for 18 months. Thank you, Mac Geek. Right. Yeah. Twitch subs making it happen. Um, uh-huh. We get a bunch of things, uh, you know, a bunch of different roles, a bunch of different tiers on Patreon uh, up to like access to our Discord, show note access. You get early access to videos, things like that, live and uncut versions of these episodes. If you need two, three, sometimes four extra hours of content in your life that is Linux related, yeah, do that. Join us for live streams. We do um, gaming streams as well because it's Linux mm-hmm. Gamecast, right? Yeah, Tuesdays absolutely. and Fridays. Track Mania fun. <laughs> Straight up Track Mania days. And uh, Thursdays, Jordan does Borderlands. He's going through Borderlands. I don't know what he'll be up to after that, but. Jordanlands. The Jordanlands. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'm going to be, um, and I'll be back on Sundays. Saturday, we do Linux Teamcast Weekly. That's our longest show. And um, Sundays, I do an editing stream, which is just like a chill. Come hang out, ask your Linux mm-hmm. questions. I'm going to be around because I'm around for like three and a half, four hours, where you can have those long form. Um, like, hey, what do I do this? Or I'm thinking about doing this. I can get back to you where I can, like get back to you in the middle of a show or like during a segment break, you know, because we got to get in and get out. So we thank you for your support. Mm-hmm. We also have a store, stored at LinuxGamecast.com, mugs, shirts, bags with Frank. See, Frank, yeah, look, look at Frank just chilling Frank. out back there, being himself, but he's also available as a tote bag because that's how he rolls and uh, wall posters. <laughs> so I think that's it. Uh, what else? Uh, we got a bunch of stuff on the um, LinuxGamecast.com. We got Amazon Wishlist and all the other fun stuff. That's how you end mm-hmm. up back here on this wall. And Jill's got a bunch of stuff on hers that's like blinks more than this sign behind me. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> Fine. Your support lets us do stuff like this because every now and then, people, every now and then, we're able to get together. Myself, Jordan, mm-hmm. and Pedro. And do something that f- is frighteningly close. Frighteningly similar. To a professional thing. And that's what we, we went ahead and got this uh, out of 2023 really early. Um, this is the alpaca review because Pedro decided to make a thing. He got one of the early review units of the 3D printed controller. And you know what? Controllers can be used for all kinds of things unrelated to gaming. At least that's going to be the excuse I'm using to talk about this anyway. And the alpaca's promise is like the performance of a mouse combined with the convenience of gamepad, all while being completely open source. We're talking down to the firmware, too. Powered by Raspberry Pi Pico. 3D printed. um, Not one, but two gyros. Pedro was really excited about that. He's like, two gyros? Mm -hmm. So cool. Touch-sensitive surfaces. It's got a scroll wheel. Jordan's hung up on the scroll wheel. And he's like, does it scroll? Unfortunately, you know, Pedro kind of went through it. And he's like, eh, what do I think about it? What's good? What's bad? Look, there's a Raspberry Pi. Aw. Look at it. And that's one of the Raspberry Pis that you can pick up. It's not wireless. And Pedro wasn't very pleased about that. (laughs) Yeah, he wants wireless. (laughs) Um, We wanted USB-C if it was going to be wired. So, And it's not USB-C. It's a USB mini, which is unfortunate. Yeah, the mini. But that's that's just (laughs) part of... uh, That's the connector that's on the uh, Pi Pico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But there's a full write-up, a nice, long, chunky write-up, along with a video with some gameplay showing this guy off. And um, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Gusto, mm-hmm. stop for some good energy. Order online. That's a weird ad. Uh, 
Yeah, Pedro shows that, you know, with the dual gyros, uh, games like uh, Half-Life 2, and this is really cool. I mean, it's uh, if you've had a Steam Deck, this wouldn't be too crazy for you, but the Alpaca has uh, profiles. So you can have profiles for different games and the different button settings and different calibrations for accelerometers and all that. Much like the Steam Deck did or still does, mm -hmm. I guess. Not Steam Deck, but the uh, Steam Controller. Steam Controller, yeah. So he was able to play Elden Ring, Half-Life 2, and they have a couple of games, like eight games currently supported, and you can, you know, it's something that users can add to. So yeah, I was really happy that uh, we got all that together and we got it pushed out. And, uh, you know, it, it's good for everybody because there's not really been a good open source controller that I know of anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't think so either, Ben. That that's that's one of the best the best options and I thought, you know, Pedro did an excellent review and I actually li really liked his suggestions about moving the scroll wheel closer to the center of of the controller and the home button up higher where the LEDs are located so you don't accidentally hit that. I thought that was a really good suggestion. And I really think it's cool how Input Labs is focusing on accessibility with controllers, with its Alpaca controller and the in development one handed controller, troller, their Capybara controller. I think that's awesome. And uh, because I, I am someone that has small hands and I like smaller controllers, I use personally, I use the 8 bit do, you know, the, this tiny guy. And because it fits my hands, because I have like, <laughs> I like kids' hands. <laughs> so bigger controllers uh, are harder to handle. But this controller looks like it's a really nice size, too. And um, I'm intrigued by the scroll wheel also. And, you know, the size of the controller, because it just, it looks like it's going to fit my hands. <laughs> so it's like a, a good size. Yeah, I mean, it looks neat, doesn't it? Um, yeah. I like the pol polygonal look, too. Polygon look. I got to be, like, 100%. Like, when I can order one for, like, 60 or 70 bucks, that's when I'll get one. I won't go through the trouble of, like, setting it. Again, I've come, in, come so close to buying a modern 3D printer, and it's reasons like yeah. this I don't know why, <laughs> because I would probably spend, like, $8,000 in PLA and other materials, like, prototyping and working on it, making... But having an open source design like that means that if you have or are willing to acquire the technical know-how, you can shrink everything down. You can make the mm -hmm. perfect controller just for you, which is super neat. And that's something mm -hmm. that you just can't currently do. You know, you got to shop yeah. around. You, you got to pick pick between your children. You know, you're like, which one? Yeah, these features. But maybe oh. I can like make make this one work. Maybe the battery life's better on this one. Plenty of things to play around. Now, good news, everybody. Raspberry Pis are back in stock. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> for corporations. Um, for yeah. Vodafone, anyway. Uh, Vodafone has decided to unveil their prototype 5G network built on a Raspberry Pi computer. I'm so excited. Uh, Vodafone wrote an entire article about femtocells uh, without using that word a single time. Yeah, <laughs> this is true. Because that's what you made, <laughs> Vodafone. That's what that is. That's a 5G Fento cell. Um, anyway, yeah, this is basically uh, one of the reasons that you're not been able to get a Raspberry Pi in 2023. Yeah, 2022, absolutely. Or 2021 <laughs> or 2020. Uh, not this exactly, but you know that decision to supply uh, corporations versus like hobbyists in the educational system with a Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi's. Um, you know, you know, I, at this point, I'm kind of done complaining. I was like, we'll, we'll just go on and pick another SBC to play around with. But yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's another one. Raspberry Pi is Raspberry. Ah, this is another weird one, isn't it? So, what is a Fentazol? If you get bad cell reception, anybody had one of these, you can uh, take this and plug regular internet connection into it. And it's just going to rebroadcast that signal. So you will get like the regular five bars or wherever. And this is going to have the five G's. So you could have like something that will give you the brain worms like right in your house. <laughs> It'll be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> if you've met, met people that don't understand uh, radio waves very well. Have you run into these people? Oh, like the five yeah. G's? Or, I got to wear my um, aluminum helmets and... Like, yeah, and then there's the Bluetooth, yeah, <laughs> argument, and yeah. 
<laughs> People don't like radio waves, although there's thousands and thousands of them around them, and they don't even seem to notice that. <laughs> The uh, whatever. <laughs> well, that was like one of those weird characters. If you've watched Better Call Saul, his um <laughs> brother had a, a EM. He uh he was allergic to EM oh, radiation, okay. electric, electric. Yeah, like lights or yeah. anything like that. That as long as he knew that there was EM radiation, because it was all psychosomatic. Mm-hmm. It was all in his head because nobody has that type of sensitivity. To, uh, and but I'm like, no, it gives me the headaches. I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Go, uh, just we're we're gonna die of plenty of natural causes. Don't worry about Wi-Fi killing you. Uh, yeah, five G is not gonna take you out. Trust me on this. Uh, I'm also not a doctor. I'm not a five G doctor. But it's got a red. The same thing happened with four G too. <laughs> so it's just like you know, as the technology becomes better and better, the, the you know pundits are. Uh, <laughs> who believe in in not science <laughs> it's just not even pundits it's, it's ignorant it's like, people yeah 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 not pundits yeah <laughs> i don't know man uh <laughs> anyway yeah you, you, you just vodafone hey they got a prototype 5g network built on it's going to be using more of the raspberry Pis, which makes me a little grumpy that apparently they don't have a problem getting raspberry Pis. Yeah, I know that that was my first thought too. Been reading, reading this article uh, is yeah, it's gonna require the Raspberry Pi Foundation to ramp up supply for the Raspberry Pi fours because this is huge. I mean, Vodafone is one of the major carriers in Europe and in Africa, mm -hmm. and yeah, they're they're aiming this five uh, G based mobile private network to be more accessible. Uh, to the 22 million small and medium size enterprises across Europe, and it can be used to extend FG, uh, uh, FG, <laughs> 5G coverage in the household. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Mir says, I want 6 gig, man. Yeah, <laughs> same here, Ven <laughs> and, and Mir. <laughs> 6G. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, audio doesn't sound as uh, warm and smooth as it did when it was sent over CDMA. Yeah. <laughs> I really like the, like the rich tone. Um, I don't know. There, there's got to be some digital hipsters out there or something. Yeah. <laughs> nah, man. 5G sounds too harsh, man. I like my music streamed with 3G. Uh, I don't know. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to make anybody upset with that. I just wanted to remind people, like, this is where your Raspberry Pis are going. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Uh, this is know. why the prices are higher for us end users. Because scalpers are selling them? Yeah. <laughs> There's not a positive spin on this at all. This is like, this no. is where the Raspberry Pis are going. This is why you can't buy Raspberry Pis. Yeah. It sucks. It sucks for all of us. It makes me sad. It makes me a sad panda. But again, I'm I'm welcome. This is like the last time I'm ever going to bring that up because from now on, you know, we can complain about that or we can start putting our time and energy into different ecosystems. And there's plenty of good ecosystems yeah. to be focusing on that are available for Absolutely. hobbyist educators and students. So we're going to start. Uh, Orange pie, banana prize. <laughs> All the rock chip-based yeah. stuff, man. All, All the, the rock, rock chip. chip. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, we're going to roll some credits, Fate, so go ahead. Cut the internet okay. off. <laughs> Let's see if Yay. we can get out of here. <laughs> and <laughs> we a have on it. <laughs> a lot of people to thank as we roll the credit credits. 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 <laughs> credits. <laughs> like Bugs Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> Yay. Now oh, we have some new people in chat as well. Rev Malay, welcome. <laughs> the problem with white Quidditch. cylinders is uh, the runtime. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We have tons of awesome ex executive producers and. Our Chicago level people, our sea monsters, our death notes. <laughs> Too many people for me to mention them all. 
But right now in chat, we have Steve Husband, we have Artharin, we have Mir, we have Don M. And we also have to go. And Justin. <laughs> Bye. Bye.